Good morning and welcome to another episode of Tea with Tara, conversations about writing. Today on the show, we have another special guest. All the guests are special and certainly Lenore Hart Hoyer is no exception. Lenore Hart is the author of seven novels, including Water Woman, Ordinary Springs, Becky, and The Raven's Bride. And she's a series editor of the Night Bazaar Fantastic Fiction Anthologies. Volume two of the Night Bazaar, Venice, was a 2020 Shirley Jackson Award finalist. Hart has also published short stories and nonfiction and poetry. She's received awards, grants, and fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts. As an editor at Northampton Housel Press, she oversees the acquisition of novels, memoirs, short story collections. She's also a longtime fellow of the Virginia Center for Creative Arts. And she serves on the Irish Writers Union Executive Committee. So she is a woman of many, many talents. And we are gonna to get to talk to her in just a little while. And she also teaches creative writing, by the way. Take a look at the new mug, Tea with Tara, as promised. I said I would be getting this and I did. I think it's just something fun. So hang in there and we will be right back with the Lenore Hart Foyer. Hi, welcome back to Tea with Tara, conversations about writing. And we are now joined by Lenore Hart Foyer. Lenore, how are you? I'm great, thanks for inviting me. Thank you for being here. So as always, I always start off with the first question, what led you to become a writer? When did you first realize that this was your life? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, it wasn't like a childhood thing. Uh, I mean, I always was a very avid reader and I could write really well, you know, even in elementary school, but I always thought I was going to be an artist. Um, I had artists in the family and I was very drawn to visual, to visual arts. Um, I also then later in high school thought I'd be a lawyer, <laughs> which I guess the writing skills would have come in handy there too. But by the time I got to college, uh, I think by about the middle of college, I had, because I'd taken, you know, a number of, of literature and writing courses, I realized at that point that what really drew me, I mean, I still was in, I, I dropped the law part, but I was still interested in the visual arts. But I, what I realized that what really drew me at that time was writing, particularly poetry. So I started actually right after I graduated as a poet and I worked in the, um, National Endowment for the Arts Poets or Artists in the Schools program. And I was one of the poets that, that visited schools. I did that for three years, actually. It was a great gig. Um, so I got to teach kids of all ages, you know, about poetry, to appreciate it, to write it, you know, to feel, you know, free and creative to do that. Because, of course, in school, it's, there's a lot of rules with writing, and that's the way, what they associated writing with. And that gave them a chance to see that no, actually writing can be fun and it can be creative and you don't always have to adhere to the rules. In fact, it's sometimes it's a good idea not to. So I enjoyed that. And I think at that point I was hooked. Um, what I didn't yet know though, was that I would end up being a novelist because <laughs> uh, I wrote poetry for quite a while. And, uh, but I did notice finally, gradually, it occurred to me that what I was writing, the poems were getting longer and longer and longer and kind of awkward eventually. Like, this is like an epic, you know, I don't know that there's much call for epic poetry these days. <laughs> and it finally dawned on me, oh, duh. And they were also narrative, almost always narrative poems. Uh, I guess I'm a fiction writer maybe, or, you know, a story, but I ended up kind of skipping directly from poetry to novels and went to short stories later. So that's my whole writing history, I guess. Oh, that's really amazing. I, I thought maybe it would have started when you were little. Not really. I mean, like I said, I always appreciated books, stories, reading. I, I learned I was reading on my own by the time I was four. So maybe that was sort of an early clue I didn't really understand. <laughs> that was just, you know, I assumed it was the appreciation of the story rather than the creating of the story. I don't think that really occurred to me. Oh, except one time I did, I did do some writing in sixth grade. For some reason, I had a, a, a kind of a stint of writing there, writing stories, um, and, but with artwork. So I guess that was maybe also another clue. I just, you know, the gods were trying to tell me and I wasn't paying attention, I suppose. <laughs> exactly, right. So yeah. who, were your, who were your, the authors that you looked up to growing up? And are they the same today or have they changed a little bit? Uh, no, probably not. I mean, I liked, I, I didn't read a lot of, I think poetry came later in college. So I would say in terms of fiction, 
I loved stories about animals. I loved, um, well, like Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings, for instance, you know, The Yearling, and I, that was one of my favorite books. Um, I really enjoyed anything that featured animals, uh, unless, of course, the animals were being, you know, hurt. I, that's one thing I couldn't, I couldn't stand. I really, though, I guess my earliest memory is of really getting into uh, Greek mythology. So rather older authors there. <laughs> but that, I think, was another clue, probably, you know, looking back, that, that could, because those, those myths, um, those myths really encompass all the stories, you know, all the plots, everything is right there. And those archetypes in them, the archetypal characters and plots are still figure in stories now. So I think mythology and also fairy tales, fairy tales, I had a, a, co a collection of the the Grimm, Grimm Brothers fairy tales, not, not a Disney type version. This was the original version, very old book that had been my mother's and she gave it to me. Now these were the dark original tales. They were not meant to make kids like feel good, you know, like with little animal sidekicks. These were the, <laughs> these were the real thing. You know, the actual <laughs> German versions where, you know, little kids, they didn't do the right thing or, or you know, wandered off into the woods, you know, bad things happened to them. And those really um, intrigued me too. And I suspect probably later on kind of led me to be very interested in my teens in gothic novels and horror stories and things like that. So do you like Edgar Allan Poe? People like him? Uh, yes, my father, in fact, was an Edgar Allan Poe fanatic, which is hence my name. Uh, <laughs> his first choice was Annabelle Lee from that poem. My mother said, absolutely not. That sounds like a name for a cow. So <laughs> I don't know why. His second choice was Lenore from The Raven and the poem Lenore. So that's how I ended up being Lenore. And wow. so, yes, that was actually, yeah, I, I pretty early on kind of glommed onto Edgar Allan Poe because of that and because there were a lot of books, you know, of his stories and books in the house. So, yes, yes, that was a big deal too. Yes, yeah, so your writing was in your, it was your destiny. Yeah, I just didn't get it till much no, later. Yeah. Yeah, I was fighting it with the visual art. Yes. So, do you think you have to be a reader to be a good writer? How do you think the two intersect? Well, I mean, I think you have to be a reader of some kind. I don't know that you have to be the kind of reader I was. I was the kind of reader that my sister and all my cousins were always angry at me <laughs> because they would be out playing and I'd have my, as I said, my nose in a book, you know, come on out, you know. So we lived in Florida, so it probably saved my skin, but I, I would almost much rather be reading a book either indoors or out under a tree, you know, the cats, the cat in my lap, than running around playing, although I did some of that too, but they didn't, I don't think anybody, I can't remember anybody in the neighborhood or in my family, I mean, the kids, who really seemed to feel the same way. So I was kind of a, a loner in that respect. And I, although I did, of course, engage in family activities, I was often, they were off playing and I was reading a story. So clue number five, I guess. And when you're working on a project, I've heard other writers, I, I can't remember which writer said this, but one of them stated that just before they start writing a book, they won't read anything because they're afraid of mimicking the style, copying ideas. How do you feel about that? Hmm. Well, I don't know. I guess, I, I mean, I could see, I guess it depends. Again, it will depend on the writer. I mean, I think some people have more of a tendency to do that. Um, what I try to do before I'm, I mean, I can't not read anything right before I start writing because for instance, my, I, I, read, I read a lot of historical novels, for instance. So I'm constantly researching, even after the writing starts, I'm still reading things, you know, finding information that I need. That is though, primarily nonfiction um, or other sources like old newspapers, things like that. Um, I think as long, I mean, in my case, as long as I'm reading a book that isn't too close to what I'm writing, that it, I, I, I don't think that it affects, certainly doesn't affect my style because I have a fairly distinct style that kind of carries over through most of my books, um, often first person, very direct, um, very detailed, but, but also compact prose. So I don't think I've, you know, read something really flowery and had it turn me into a, you know, flowery Victorian type stylist. Um, but I guess for some people that, that can be an issue. Um, and they are really affected, not just by the story they read, but by the style that it's in. But I haven't really ever noticed that to be the case for me. So I, I'd say, you know, judge for yourself, you know, if you're a writer, become aware that that 
can be a problem for you. And then, you know, try not to read, but I've, but I've also had, I've had, I think that can be carried to extremes because for instance, when I was teaching undergraduate creative writing at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, I had a few times when I, I would start the classes by going up and down the, the rows and saying, so, you know, before we you know this first class, you know, introduce yourself and tell me something you've been reading lately that you really like. And most people had an answer, but then I get, there was usually at least one person in the class who said, well, well, I'm a poet or I'm a, you know, I mean, we're talking about 18 year olds, so they were, but they were already leaning that way. I'm a poet or I'm a, you know, a fiction writer, but I don't read anything because I don't want it to affect my style. So literally saying they read nothing, not just before they write, but period, because they seem to believe they could develop in a vacuum, which of course we know is not true. So, right. That. And how do you come up with your topics for writing? Because isn't it true? I mean, everything has been covered, right? I always say there's nothing unique to write anymore. We've covered everything, but it's the unique part is in how we write because every writer has their own style and their own way of telling a story. Oh, absolutely, yes, I think that's true. I mean, really, I mean, if you look, look at the, you know, in terms of plot for a story, those were all covered, you know, back in ancient times. <laughs> I mean, everything really was covered. So you could have said, well, no new plots. Why do we need to write anything? And, and it's and, all it's recycled, like right? Right, right. We're recycling the plots. So it's not the plot. I mean, the, the basic level, you know, there can be new twists and turns, but the basic plots that you see in a book that comes out in 2022 are going to be the same as some things that were written, you know, two, 3,000 years ago. But um, the difference is, as you said, it's how the writer presents it. Um, and that means the differences are not in that basic plot, but rather in what characters are chosen. Maybe this is a retelling of a myth in a way, but the character is female, not male, um, and is taking place in the future or in the present day and in a, you know, a, a completely different setting. And the focus is on something, you know, the themes are on something entirely different. So that's, yeah, that's exactly right. You can't, there really is nothing new under the sun when it comes to plots because plots are really based on human behavior and that hasn't really changed, <laughs> unfortunately, in some cases, all that much, you know, over the millennium. So they're yeah. still the same, but how you choose to show it and what you choose to show and where and when, those things are within the writer's control and those can be new. Right, yeah, the behaviors haven't changed, right? We're the same kind of person, <laughs> we're just in different clothes. Exactly, yes, exactly. So when you're writing fiction, what comes first to you? Do you see the characters first or are you thinking of the plot? Well, when I when a story comes to me, yeah, it, it does tend to start with a character. Um, but the character is not just a character. The character is usually doing something. It's kind of odd. I, I've tried to explain this before. It's it's a process, obviously, that takes place in my head, but it's kind of visual, almost like I'm seeing a film in my head. And it's often it's just a glimpse or a very short period in which. And as I, I can tell now, I mean, I didn't notice this at first, I can tell now that it's usually evoked either by something I've read or just watched or um, even an experience I've had, like, you know, it, it's a kind of akin to, let's say you're on the train, you know, and you're riding and, you, and then it pulls into the station and you glance, you, you glance out the window and you see a couple arguing, you know, and he shoves her, you know, and then stomps off. I mean, that's, it's, it, you know, something that quickly, that it happens that quickly can evoke a story for me or even a novel. Um, sometimes it's when I'm reading uh, nonfiction, especially historical works, or I think back to things that I have read and I think not that I could do it better, but that I could do it differently or show something new about an old work. For instance, when I wrote Becky, The, Lives and, the Life and Loves of Becky Thatcher, that was my retelling of Tom Sawyer. So, you know, on the one hand, I'm telling every other chapter, I'm telling the story of their childhood, only there's some different twists in there. Um, and then in, in the other alternating chapters, I'm telling their present day story all the way up to when they were about 80 years old. And that was evoked by a trip to Hannibal, Missouri, um, which we took, I took with my husband. And, and, you know, we went to all the usual, the caves, Tom Sawyer's, or rather Mark Twain's house. And as we were leaving, my husband asked me, well, if you were gonna write, you know, a, a story based on Tom Sawyer, you know, which character would it be? And I said, oh, Becky, absolutely, because she really got the short end of the stick. I mean, all she gets to do is weep into her apron, you know, and whine and cry. And I just don't believe, you know, despite what Victorians always said about children, that was so, you know, the girls were supposed to be so meek and ladylike and never get dirty. I just didn't believe that was really what happened. So I wanted to write her stories. So that's, so even another book, especially an older one like that can evoke a story for me. 
a different that's story. Something, yeah, that's something I've always wanted to do, try to write a story from one of the uh, uh, famous characters' perspective. Is that hard to do? Did you find that difficult? Because I've, I've been afraid to tackle that so far. Well, I think, I mean, I don't know about hard. I mean, I guess in some ways it can be hard. I mean, on the one hand, it might seem like it might be easier because some of that's already been laid out for you. And of course, this would have to be not copyrighted stuff, but, you know, of course, Twain's was long out of copyright. So if it's material that's now in the public domain, you know, in, in a way, you know, the place, the time, everything that is sort of laid out for you, if you're going to do it, you know, in that particular place and not move it to a different time or, you know, or, or geographical area. So that might seem easy, but I guess the hard part comes in that in, and that is that when you take the character, especially one that is very famous, you know, almost iconic, like say Tom Sawyer and the, the characters in that book, you really, really have to know what you're writing about. You have to know everything about it. So I, I discovered after I wrote the book, you know, people would say, wow, I love this novel, you know, Becky. And you know what? Now I think I'm going to go and read the Tom Sawyer book. They hadn't actually read it. But of course, they all knew about Tom Sawyer. They might have seen him in a, a cartoon or a film or whatever on TV, you know, but they had never actually read the book. So but a lot of people have and do know all those things. And so those people are the ones that are going to read your book with a critical eye. So you want to be very aware of, I think, not just the characters, but also the author. So I did a lot of reading. That was one of the books, Becky, which I had, gosh, four years of research before I started writing it because I was reading all of uh, Twain's novels. You know, there's a number of Tom Sawyer novels and all of his letters and you know memoirs and books about him before I felt like I was really, really kind of saturated and up to date on everything I needed to know in order to effectively write that book. And do you enjoy the, the research process or do you find it, it can it be exhausting? Um, I think, well, I enjoy it. I think I do enjoy it. I mean, and I think a lot of writers do. And the danger, of course, when you're doing that kind of in-depth research, you know, and especially with a lot of material is you have to remind yourself that in the end, when you're actually writing the book, you cannot put, you know, the 15 pages of the pamphlet on uh, silver ore processing <laughs> that I read right into your novel, because all your readers may not be all that fascinated as you were about silver ore process. You know, you may have just a paragraph or two. But, you know, in order to find out what you need, you end up reading a lot of material that, in, you know, is really not going to go into the book, at least not directly. It probably will influence how you write the things. But I think it's really important, you know, even if you do find research hard, then I wouldn't recommend, I guess, historical novels. But if you find it hard or you feel like you're pressed for time, you know, that could be a problem because, I mean, I have seen manuscripts and occasionally even published works where they've kind of made the people in this you know 19th century novel talk and act like people in the 22nd century i mean 22nd century <laughs> that you know in our century not in the 22nd so and it's very jarring because you know it's just not accurate and i mean if it's done for effect like a parody or something that's one thing but if you're trying to write a realistic historical novel you have to understand that those people are not going to act like we do look at things the way we do, you know, socially, politically. I mean, those people would not like us probably, and we would not like them at this point, but that's how you have to balance it when you're creating a character like that, is to create a character that's realistic for their time without alienating the reader in our time that's going to be reading about them. And stick to the lexicon of the character of the time. Right, right. I mean, not to a ridiculous extent, because sometimes I think people sometimes base dialogue also, like say 19th century, on letters. And the letters were much more flowery than the way people actually talked. But the way I, one thing, an interesting thing I discovered about that was, for instance, a uh, part, a good part of Becky was set during the Civil War. That was when they would have been adults in their 20s, you know, had they, when they grew up. So I had one way I found of finding out more how people actually talk was to get um, to look at, you know, like photocopies of, or not photocopies, but like, you know, microfiche of the newspapers of the time. And also, um, I, if I wanted jokes and things like that, more casual things, Civil War soldier, um, newspapers made especially for Civil War soldiers had lots of jokes in them, you know, and things like that that would have been that were very colloquial. So that helped me with the colloquial speech, too, so that it didn't sound too formal and flowery, you know, for just the person in the street. What is your writing process like? Do you write at night? Do you write in the day? How often do you write? 
Well, because I have so many, I have a lot of different irons in the fire and I almost always have. So I have to admit, I hate to admit it because I always tell my students not to do this. I don't write every day, um, I, I, but I do write regularly. And, and I'm also I, what I call writing in my head all the time. That I do do every day. I'm working on it in my head, thinking about what I'm going to do next. Um, so, but I do write every week and sometimes, you know, every day in that week, maybe sometimes only a couple days that week, but I'm always doing something for or about the next book, uh, researching, making notes, thinking in my head, imagining scenes like the next scene I'm going to write. Um, so that's, that's how I, you know, as I go along, because, in, and the problem, of course, for me is that I've done a lot of things. I've, we've got a small press, so I'm also an acquisitions editor, mostly for fiction and for memoirs. Um, I've also taught in a number of venues, like right now I have a local writing workshop that I've had run for 25 years here in Southeastern Virginia. And that is, um, that is going on about three times a year for 10 weeks at a time. So I've got to, you know, interact with those students and, you know, help them with their writing. And then I'm sometimes working on additional projects like, uh, articles for magazines or maybe some editorial work I've agreed to take on. So there's all those things going on at the same time. And I think it's dangerous in a way because when you work in writing, if you're a writer, you know, writing books, writing stories, but you also work in a job that requires writing, you can really get burned out and, and they find it hard to do any writing. So, you know, I just know that happens. So if you're that kind of person and your biggest goal is to write novels or write books of any kind, you might want to look for a job that does not say is not a technical writing job, because I've noticed that, for instance, some of the authors at our press have writing jobs like that, and they find it very difficult to stick with and finish, you know, their next project because they're so burned out on writing by the time they get home. So that's not my process, but I, but I do have to balance all those things. So when I finally start writing, um, usually before I start, I create um, a synopsis. I don't do outlines because I found that I get entranced by about the second or third, you know, chapter part. And then before I know it, I'm writing the novel and they're like, oh, whoa, whoa, back, you know, just, I only mean to write a few sentences. So I found that the synopsis, a detailed synopsis of about six, six to eight pages works best for me just to keep me on track. And then if the, you know, in my schedule, if I'm taken away from the writing for very long, like for several days or even a couple of weeks, you know, in an extraordinary circumstance, then what I do is go to the manuscript on screen back up about a chapter, go through that chapter, read it, and even make some, you know, revisions as I go. And then by the time I'm at the end of that chapter, I am definitely right back in the book. You know, I don't have to worry about feeling something like, oh, writer's block, which I don't really believe in. I think writer's block is just the writer's version of, I don't want to go to work today. <laughs> you know? so, yeah. Almost every writer I've interviewed has said that. <laughs> There's no such thing yeah. as writer's block. Yeah, I think it's more a mindset, and but of course it, it isn't, you know, you know, why would everybody know that, especially if they're starting out, they won't know that, and it feels like this really, you know, horrendous, you know, just impossible thing to get over, but it's not, if you learn what you need to do about it, and mine, as I just said, is to go back to the, you know, a, a previous chapter, go through that, and I don't have those feelings anymore, I'm, I'm just fully immersed again, but there's, I'm sure there's other ways, they just have to deal with it in that way, because there really isn't a block you know, the material is there, it's waiting to come out, and you just have to figure out the way that you kind of jumpstart it so it can do that, and you get over this anxiety or fear or whatever it is that's keeping you from doing it. So that's how I did that. Do you find yourself acting out your characters as you're writing when you're all by yourself and you're thinking of, because I, I've done that, and I actually, my landlord actually came in the house once he had to fix something, and he came in and he heard me having this dialogue, and I'm thinking, oh, I could just imagine, but he, I'm a writer, I'm, I don't have any other issues. Yeah, that could, <laughs> that could be awkward, depending on, on where you're, you're doing it, or who's there, um, and I do have, a, a, we, I, you know, we live in a, in a remote area, and my husband's also a writer, and he's in the house too, but he's, we're always busy, and so I, I do often find myself just talking to myself, even not about writing, so, or to the cats, maybe, um, but yeah, I do occasionally, um, but I think I can kind of hear them in my head so clearly that I don't usually feel the need to talk out loud, but it's, I think it's, I do sometimes use it more as and I, when I feel that maybe a passage is kind of feeling kind of awkward, because I know later on, well, if I have, to, so I say it to myself, if I had to read this aloud, would it sound awkward? Would it be hard to, 
you know, hard to do. I mean, are the sentences so long that I'll run out of breath before I get to the end? You know, so I that in a case like that, I sometimes read it aloud. But the characters' voices are always, I mean, seem pretty clear to me. I, I guess I just have, maybe I have um, not much trouble creating dialogue. The, the, the thing that I have the most trouble with actually isn't any of that, it is structure. I guess I must be really otherwise a very unstructured person because that was the thing that was hardest for me to learn was how to effectively structure a novel, especially. Right. Not so much a short story, but a novel. Um, because it's so complex. And if you're, you're covering different time periods, you know, is it better to start at the beginning and go through chronologically, or maybe you want to start it, you know, toward the end and then flash back and do that. So learning all of that, I found very difficult and, and it wasn't helped in this case, I have an MFA, but in my MFA program, the, the semester that we were supposed to get our hands-on practical narrative structure class, the, the professor who always did that was on sabbatical. So they turned us over to a literature person and I came out of that class thinking I still don't have any idea of how, how to structure because it was more about the critical the aftermath and you know critical theory not the so so that further you know kind of handicapped me in that area and it took me many years and lots of trying and lots of rearranging and getting advice from other writers to finally get a really good grasp of structure so that's how I handled that why do you think people want to be writers? Uh, the author George Orwell once said that we write out of sheer egoism. Do you agree with that? I mean, why do you think one of us, want, any of us want to just wake up one day and say, yeah, I, I just want to be a writer. Where does that come from? Do I agree with that? Well, not entirely, but I mean, I, I think it's, it's fair enough. There has to be some element of egoism in any of the arts. I mean, at least if you're going to do it, not just privately for yourself because you have to believe that what you're creating, whether it's a painting, you know, or music or a book or a film or whatever is good enough that people should want to see it or read it or listen to it. So there is, and I don't think that's unhealthy. I think that's, you know, that's good that you, you have, you have that confidence you're, you're building slowly building that confidence in yourself that enables you to take your art, whatever it is out into the world. Um, but that's egoism, not being egotistical. Now, I think the egotistical thing would be if you, you know, read a few books or read a couple craft books and, you know, write a story or a novel and think, well, I've got it down now, you know, <laughs> I understand it, you know, I'm a master of the craft. That would be definitely ego egotism and very foolish um, because after, oh, I don't know, 40 years of writing, I still don't feel, no, more than that, I don't feel like a master of the craft. I'm constantly learning things every day. But I think that there's some egoism involved in just being able to put put it out there to go to readings um, or, you know, just to believe that you have a and I'm putting this in, you know, in, in quotation marks, a right to do this, because some people can't feel that way. They have great difficulty with that and have terrible trouble, you know, exposing their work even to one other person. So that's and if they're happy with that, that's fine. You know, Emily Dix Dickinson kind of comes to mind, you know, it worked out for her, but much later, unfortunately, after she was gone. So, so yeah, so I think, I think there it's, it is, it does require some amount of ego in order to do that. But the ego can, of course, get in the way also when after a certain point in time, it, you know, the writer just decides that they already know it all, you know, and they can't be edited or they can't be corrected or they can't learn anything new. Then I think it's a warning sign. So that's, I guess that's the way I look at that. But um, I think people become writers. I mean, I think people publish, I guess I should say, they publish for different reasons. I, I, and this is maybe a little reductive, but when I think about it, to me, it seems like there's two kinds of people who publish books. There are people who are writers and then there are who want to be writers. And then there are people who want to be authors. And I think it's two different things. What is the, that was if, one of my questions actually, what's the difference between oh. a writer and an author? Oh, okay. Well, that nice segueing right into that. So I think that people who want to be writers who are really, really dedicated to that idea and really just get lost in the writing and, and want to do it, they're going to write, even if they don't find an outlet or much of an outlet for their work, they're, they're not going to stop because of that, because it's, it's part of them. I mean, it's, they have to do it. And it's almost like therapy for some, or it's just it's like an obsession or it's their, you know, direct objective, the thing they have to do, just like they have to breathe or, you know, or eat food or sleep. 
And then there are people who, and I'm not, I'm not saying this to condemn anybody. I'm just saying, I think this, I've just noticed this, this big kind of divide there. Then there are people who their main goal isn't necessarily to be a writer, but rather to be a published author. And there's, uh, there seems to be various reasons for that. I mean, and, and of course now the way publishing works with, with the self-publishing tools that people have, you could just throw something together. You could throw something together in a week, whether it made sense or not, and you know, publish it and put it out there if you want to. Or I wouldn't advise it, but that's what you know, it can be done. And I think that those people get the most gratification from the product that comes after the process. You know, they want to have that book to hold in their hands or to post about, you know, on social media. And so they can go around, and those are the people, <laughs> those are usually the people that you'll find have a business card that says author. You know, I mean, some writers have business cards too, but it's like that was the whole thing that they were going for and they got it and they want everybody to know. And that's what makes them feel good. That finished product. I have a book. I made a book or, you know, however many books. Whereas I think for writers, I mean, certainly for writers, there's certainly gratification in publication too. But, you know, as I said, if they couldn't publish, because I know some really wonderful writers, at least um, I have over the course of my life, who never actually published anything they wrote, and yet they were wonderful writers. And some of them were unhappy about it, but most of them, that was just what they wanted to do, or it was for their families. So I think that's the difference. Writers will write regardless. It doesn't matter if they get that gratification in the end. And people who are more key to the, to the author aspect they would be miserable, be made miserable by that if they could not publish. And that was their goal. So each has a slightly different goal, they, you know, which overlaps. But I think that's the way I look at it, is writer versus author. Who do you think the audience is when you're, when you're writing a book, not the audience, but who are you supposed to be writing for? Are you writing what other people want to read or are you writing what you want to write? That's a good question. That's a hard one to answer too, because I mean, a lot of it is of course going to depend on what you're writing. If your goal is to write poetry that's deeply intimate and personal, I think you're writing, you know, since something like, at least when I've done that, I'm really writing for myself, but I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm not just writing it down like something I put in a journal, I, you know, I'm, I'm putting it down as a first draft. And then I'm going back and trying to see how I can make it more, more vivid and meaningful and accessible to other people, to the reader. But if you're writing, on the other hand, if you're writing, let's say you've decided you want to write a series um, of thrillers, then obviously you can't just write for yourself because you've got to think about the market and how you're going to sell it and whether readers will be able to follow the plot if it's believable, you know, and if they'll be enthralled enough by it so that you can, you know, put this series out. So I think it, a lot of that just depends on what you're working on. Some things like poetry, some short stories will allow you to kind of write for yourself. But I think even so, you know, that poem, that story, at a certain point, you do have to look at it even if an edit, it's an editor that makes you do it, you have to look at it from the viewpoint of the reader at some point. And that usually, if it doesn't come to you sooner, that's gonna come in the revision process when somebody's telling you, well, this passage makes no sense to me at all. You're gonna to have to go back and redo that or make it clear because I don't understand what you're saying here or this dialogue just doesn't ring true to me. It doesn't sound like people are really talking, you know? So that may not come until the point where say an editor has their hands on your story or your novel and they're telling you, I love this. It's great. But here are some problematic areas, you know, that readers are not going to be able to deal with. And here's what you got to do. And then so at that point, whether you're the kind of writer who starts out thinking of, you know, your audience or not, at that point, you do have to think about them. So it, it, I think it will come at some point. Do you have a favorite genre to write? Because I know you said you write poetry, fiction, nonfiction. Gosh, no. <laughs> We've got so many. They're all your babies, right? Yeah, they're all my babies. Babies. Um, I, you know, poetry was my my first love, and I still occasionally. This is more a time issue. I still occasionally write write and publish poetry. I just sold a poem to um, a publication. I love the name of this Corvid Queen. You know, I love because I'm I'm really into crows and ravens, and I had this really strange poem, and I thought, where in the world? It was a long one. It's called the Swedish Necromancer. Where am I going to send this? And then I saw them. And I sent it to her and to that editor, and she got right back to me and said, wow, I really want to publish this. It was a wild ride, start to finish. You know, it's perfect for our, but I had been sending it out occasionally, and it was like, people were like, I don't really understand this. So, so yeah, I mean, that, that's my first love. But um, I think that 
after poetry, I think the novel is probably, I guess I probably like writing novels better than short stories. Cause I think it was in part, it's because I think if I really, I haven't mastered it, but I think if there's something I really know how to do well at this point in my career, I would hope after all these decades, it's to write a novel, to structure it, to figure it out, to create the characters. And I find short stories because like I said, I skipped from poetry to long form books. I find short stories the hardest thing to write. So I guess I could say they're not my favorite, you know, because I agonize over them so much. Each one, I probably could have written a novel while I was writing that short story. So I guess um, I'd have to say that novels are my my favorite. And then uh, within the novel, I think my favorite genres are, and I've usually written these in some at some point, um, fantastic fiction, what they call fantastic fiction now, which is sort of an offshoot of horror, but it's much more subtle. And it also has elements of, of uh, magical realism and fantasy. I really like dark fantasy. I don't like the stories where the elves go, you know, whistling through the woods. That's not my thing. But dark fantasy that also tackles, you know, social issues and things like that in a very subtle way. I love that. I love historical fiction. Um, I don't find myself all that captured by contemporary works that are about, you know, like the problems of people in a big city. I did that. Uh, probably because I have mostly lived in the country in small towns. It, I just don't relate to that. So I guess historical works, um, anything that I could, as I read it, I get excited because I see that it's based on a fairy tale or a myth at its heart, even if it's taking place in the present day. And um, things that just have a kind of an eerie or off feeling, I love that. So that's the fantastic fiction genre. So, so I don't have one, <laughs> but those, I guess, in a nutshell, those are the ones that I like the best. What is your what is your advice to aspiring writers? What do you usually tell your students who say, I want to be a writer? I say, if they come into a class, for instance, I say, that's great, you know, because it's it's a wonderful thing to do and, and it's a creative outlet. It's it's lots of things. It's a creative outlet. It's kind of a a therapy for you too. And, and it's it's a way to express yourself and to reach people and connect with people that you may never even meet. Um, but what I say is. But are you willing to work? Because you know it's not, especially when I'm say at an arts center, for instance. I mean, if they're in a class, they've got the you know at say a university, then they've got always, if nothing else, they've always got the motivation of the grade. You know, they're going to try to do their best, you know, to get a good grade or, or not. Um, but when it's somewhere like an arts center, I always warn them that this class may not be exactly like the others you've taken here, like pottery, macrame, whatever where, you know, by the end of the class, you come out with this finished, you know, these finished things, you know, a nice plant hanger, a beautiful pot, and you're all done. I said, especially if you're working on something long, it's not going to be like that. It's going to be a lot more work. And it's kind of a crazy, crazy business in a way, if you go into it, you know, very difficult to deal with sometimes because it involves rejection. So if you're serious about writing and you actually are serious to the point that you know, at some point you're going to want to submit things and publish stories or novels or poems you need to steal yourself for rejection and i always say but it could be worse you could be in you know in theater or a film where they're actually rejecting you here they're only going to be rejecting your story but those are things you need to take in, into consideration that you'll deal with if you're starting on this path to being a writer and also oh and also i tell them i'm going to ruin your pleasure in a lot of the books that you already read <laughs> Because once you understand, as my husband would say, how the sausage is made, <laughs> and then you get kind of more picky and critical about, you know, how things are created. Is this done well? Some of the books that you you really, really loved, you're going to go back and read them and think, oh, gosh, this is really bad. <laughs> yeah, really. There's that warning, too. <laughs> well, Lenore, it was wonderful having you on. Unfortunately, we're out of time. But can you tell everybody where we can find your books? Especially Becky, I want that one. Oh, yes. Well. Um, you, you can find them on Amazon, on Barnes and Noble. Um, they sometimes they're in, you know, bookstores are these days. It's hard to, you know, it's hard to know if a book's going to be in the bookstore or not, but they can certainly be ordered. Uh, my books are in Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Bookshop, and Kobo. And, and one of my historical novels, uh, Water Woman, is in an audiobook format. So I was okay. pretty excited about that. So they can be found anywhere like that. Um, some of the books that I've done, like the, I've done, I do, a, I'm the editor of a dark fantasy anthology called called The Night Bazaar. I'm working I'm at work on volume three right now. Um, those can also be purchased directly from Northampton House Press, which is our small press that I'm the editor for. So pretty much anywhere, really. 
Okay, wonderful. And thank you so much for being on today. I thought oh, it was a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks, Sarah. I really enjoyed it. And I have almost finished my tea. <laughs> I have water. I have to confess. Oh. I have to have water. <laughs> well, I needed the I'm supposed to have tea, but <laughs> all right. Take care. Nice talking to you. You too. You too. So that concludes another episode of Tea with Tara, Conversations About Writing. I want to thank Lenore Hart Foyer for her wonderful conversation and check out her books. She is a fantastic writer. She is a woman who wears many hats and she can do it all. So again, if you feel like you have a story inside of you begging to get out, like I always said, you might be a writer. So until next time, happy writing.